Hello, this short video introduces my short book, Engaging with Previous Research in Your Doctoral Thesis Beyond the Literature Review. The scare quotes around literature review in the title of the book are really trying to set up for you the notion that the concept of a literature review chapter is quite problematic in some ways. The word literature suggests that there is a very clearly definable body of literature out there uh, for you to um, discover a scope and so on, um, which is often not the case in many PhD and EdD theses. And the word review suggests that um, you need to take them one by one, these pieces of research, and critique them as you might do a book review or a film review. And that's really not what you're doing, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what you are doing um, as, uh, as the video goes on. So rather than talking about uh, the literature and review, I'd rather talk about engaging with the literature or even mobilizing research uh, for your own previous research, for your own uh, research. In fact, some doctoral theses don't have a literature review chapter as such. They mobilize the literature and engage with it as they need it um, within the discussion, within the, within the analysis section and so on. And in a sense, we can make a distinction as they do in manufacturing <clears throat> and distribution between just in case and just in time. So the literature review chapter at its worst, understood in the traditional way, uh, is just in case. I'll put everything into this chapter just in case I need it. Whereas the just in time approach might not have a chapter um, and introduces previous research, engages with it, mobilizes it uh, as necessary. So that's the first thing uh, to think about. Um, one of the things that often causes some issues for doctoral students, particularly at the beginning, is how to determine the content if there isn't a very clear uh, body of literature out there. I would say that there are four things that you need to think about when you're uh, constructing the content of the literature that you're going to mobilize in your uh, research and in your thesis. The first thing is the research questions and they should be one of the very early things that you do. Do the research questions suggest any areas of literature uh, that need to be addressed and engaged with? Are there any concepts in there, for example, uh, that need to be engaged with? Are there any areas of uh, previous research? Usually there will be. Second one is the methods used and the methodology in the research design. Now, it's not normal, um, not nor nor normally necessary to go into great detail about traditional uh, methods of data collection and so on, or even um, methodologies in the sense of overall research design and the underpinning sets of assumptions behind the research design. There are citations and brief references to show that you uh, are familiar with the literature uh, are enough. You don't want to be writing a textbook. But if there are any uh, unusual, particularly innovative approaches that you're using in terms of your methods or your design, then those need to be addressed through previous uh, literature and approaches. The third element of thinking about your, uh, the, 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 the particulars of the literature that you're going to engage with um, is the theoretical and conceptual resources that you're uh, deploying in your research. And clearly, um, writers who have talked about, for example, uh, critical realism or um, Bourdieu's work, if you're using that, and so on, need to be addressed. But again, uh, you don't want to be writing a textbook. You want to be thinking about um, the nature of your research in particular and how those theoretical resources are going to apply and then engage with that literature appropriately. And the fourth and final um, criterion for thinking about the content of your literature uh, engagement is the knowledge claims that you're going to be 
um, making for the value, for the significance of your research. And it's often quite hard to do that at the beginning. And that's one reason why reviewing the literature isn't a thing that you do at the beginning or in the middle. It's an ongoing uh, process um, which develops as you're uh, writing the thesis, doing the research and so on. So the kinds of claims that you're making are often related to uh, previous accumulation, agglomeration of knowledge in the area that you're looking at and what you want to show is how yours is different or adds to uh, that. <clears throat> now, in the literature, there's quite a lot of uh, literature on, on doing literature reviews. Um, you can very often find lists of ways in which uh, one should not write a literature review, the kinds of mistakes that are often made. So um, I've developed my own, but I'm going to critique these kinds of lists in a moment. First of all, giving other people's definitions of important concepts uh, without actually giving your own, which might follow somebody else's or it might be a uh, development of it. Second problem is not relating your own um, engagement with the literature to uh, the thesis, the particulars of the thesis, and not telling the reader what the point of your commentary on uh, previous research is, why it's relevant. Third one is not drawing out your own position from the discussion uh, of other people's perspectives um, in, uh, in previous research. Another issue, the fourth one, is treating the reader as a novice who needs educating. The Writing the textbook is, is uh, a, a very frequent problem um, in doctoral theses. Remember that your readers are your examiners and they're going to be well versed in, in the area and don't need to be uh, patronized or educated. Um, another problem is only describing um, elements of literature rather than engaging with it. And by engaging, I mean evaluating, analyzing, and thinking about the relevance uh, for your um, for your work. And then um, not joining up the different parts of the literature, but just going through uh, listing so-and-so uh, says this, so-and-so says that, and so on. In, again, in the way that a textbook uh, would. So look for ways to um, join up, uh, to synthesize, um, and uh, find value from um, accumulating or agglomerating the literature. And then there's the ground that you cover. One danger is not, not covering enough ground in previous research, leaving gaps um, in what you need for the rest of uh, the thesis, or probably more prevalent, is trying to cover too much ground, trying to do everything. Uh, even areas that are peripheral to the thesis or don't need an extended discussion. Um, related to that issue about the ground, one problem uh, that often crops up is to do with theory, and theoretical resources are introduced, great names are waved around, um, but not actually deployed in the thesis. So again, uh, make sure that whatever you put into your literature review chapter, um, if you have one, is uh, very pertinent to the um, content of the thesis, to your argument, and so on. Aviad, uh, in 2014, warns against the dangers of doing what she calls a narrative review, and she contrasts that with a systematic review. In her perspective, from her perspective, a narrative review um, uses undefined methods of searching, critiquing, and synthesizing the literature, whereas a systematic review uh, is very explicit and uses rigorous methods for searching, critiquing, and synthesizing the literature. So it's about being explicit about the methods and about the rigor of the methods used uh, within the approach to engagement with the literature. 
I think I'd go a bit further than her, um, because for me a narrative review is one that's like a textbook. It tells a story. It doesn't really engage. It simply describes. Um, and so that's 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 a big problem. Um, and and is one that is often found. So beware of conducting a narrative review. So if those are the negative characteristics, then clearly the desirable characteristics are the converse. Um, a, uh, the choice of which areas of previous research uh, to engage with is judicious, it's relevant, it gives fuller attention to the most relevant and less attention to uh, perhaps even just citation to areas of literature that are uh, more peripheral. It avoids the possible accusation of tendentiousness, of choosing, the, of cherry-picking the literature, um, or the accusation of bias, because it is systematic and transparent in its approach, as Aviard says. It engages with the literature, sometimes to fundamentally criticize it, uh, not being afraid to uh, really critique very fundamentally uh, the literature. And it also draws out definitions and perspectives which can be adapted or adopted in the thesis. And it does that very explicitly. It doesn't just say so-and-so says, but so-and-so says, and I make of this X, Y, Z. It's explicit about the reasons for engaging with the literatures it does and about why some areas of literature are excluded, perhaps only in passing. Um, it engages with and refines the theoretical, re where necessary, refines where necessary the theoretical resources, um, and only only engaging with those that are actually deployed in the thesis and explains how they are going to be deployed. It synthesizes, organizes, and shapes the literature in a way which is valuable for the reader and the reader's perspective on the re rest of the thesis, uh, and if there is a chapter, it does real work for the uh, for the whole thesis itself, and that's a question one should ask oneself as the chapter is developed. What what is it doing for the thesis here? How much work is it doing? What kind of work uh, is it doing? But the trouble with those kinds of lists, I said I would critique um, what I was just about to do. Um, is that uh, people don't take much notice of them, frankly. <laughs> um, and I would say there are three reasons for that. First of all, they're kind of abstracted from the detail. Um, they're um, r just abstracted statements. When you've got your own thing to think about, your own piece of research and so on, it's really quite hard to bring those abstractions and make them apply and see where they do apply uh, to uh, your own um, your own work. So that relates to the second one, which is about recognition and discrimination. Is this? Am I doing this? Am I making this mistake, or am I doing this thing which is desirable? Uh, the recognition discrimination uh, issue, which partly results from the abstraction, but partly because it's actually quite hard to uh, think about your own work. Um, and analyze it in that way because you're rather close to it. And then the third um, issue that makes it difficult to apply such lists of good and bad do's and don'ts um, is one's own purposes in writing um, a chapter which engages with the literature. And those need to be surfaced. And I think that's one of the key issues in the book um, is about surfacing your own perspective on what's, uh, what you're doing, what you're trying to do, who you're talking to, and how uh, you're talking uh, about uh, the literature. So one of the key things that I'm trying to do in talking about engaging with the literature in your doctoral thesis is to move away from thinking about the chapter and the substance to thinking instead about oneself from the chapter to the author. And in doing that, 
I've used uh, an approach which is called phenomenography. What phenomenography tries to do is to uh, look at uh, a range of data, very often interview, interview transcripts, and to try to discover what the different orientations are, are, are that uh, lay behind the production of the texts that you're analyzing. If it's an interview transcript, what are, what are the concepts that um, the speaker um, had of the, the thing that you're uh, examining? That leads to a range of orientations if you have a number of speakers or a number of textual sources and that range of orientations is called the outcome space which attempts to describe the, all the different ways in a particular context that uh, something is understood, how it's defined, um, perhaps in um, implicit ways. Now, in 1994, Christine Bruce uh, published a phenomenographic piece of research. Um, she'd studied 41 uh, students who were doing postgraduate degrees in an Australian university, and she'd done it phenomenographically. And she was interested in how do these students conceive of writing a literature review. Um, what are the different orientations? What's the outcome space about writing literature reviews? And she identified six conceptions from this group of students. The listing conception, um, the search conception, the survey conception, the vehicle for learning conception, the research facilitator conception, and the report conception. Um, and really that's a list of, of, of purposes that um, those students understood a literature review to be about. Now those students hadn't written literature reviews, they were neophyte researchers, and uh, I thought, well, that's quite a good idea, but um, I think it would be more valuable to look at actual literature review chapters in doctoral theses, PhD and EdD and other uh, doctoral theses, to use that as the raw data rather than the production of text in interviews. So I found in doing that, in looking at uh, different theses um, and draft chapters as well from my own students, my own um, PhD students, I found five key orientations um, towards the writing of the literature review. The presenter, presenting information uh, about um, the literature that's being engaged with. The critic, which speaks for itself. The taxonomist, um, orientating the literature in a way which can be categorized uh, into several broad categories and subcategories and so on. In other words, organizing the literature. The tool maker, uh, the approach that tries to develop tools that can then be applied in one's own research and in the thesis. Take, and maker is important there rather than taker, uh, just taker. Um, maybe refining tools, conceptual theoretical tools and so on that others have developed, but also making them, making new ones out of those, adapting them. And then the lacunae locator, in other words, finding gaps in the literature um, which need to be filled and perhaps are filled by the research. But I think in that uh, orientations is actually a good word, the way that you're facing. And I would say that the ideal is to look into yourself and say, what's my orientation? What's my dominant orientation? But in writing it, a chapter or in uh, infusing your uh, thesis with uh, engagement and mobilization of literature. The stance, the orientation needs to change between those five. So it's, it shouldn't be just one, it should be dynamic, it should be protein. Sometimes presenting, some, sometimes critiquing, sometimes identifying gaps, and so on. Um, as well as those five, I would say more positive ones, there are seven orientations to be identified, uh, that I did identify, uh, out of the phenomenographic analysis. Um, not a heavy-duty one, I have to say, quite a light phenomenographic 
uh, analysis of those theses. Uh, so these are ones to be very wary of. First one I've mentioned, the textbook writer. The narrative approach. Um, describing, listing, etc, etc. Second one, the demolition expert. Just going on, just going in there to criticize and demolish others so that to try to show one's own work as brand new and uh, very different. Um, and the problem there is very often it's only critical, doesn't see the positives, etc. And perhaps is very uh, selective as well um, in the literature that it chooses to engage with. The fruit picker speaks for itself, I suppose, just taking parts of literature that um, are only valuable, only useful, and ignoring other areas. Um, so that can be, if, if the survivor involved, or whether uh, where the um, uh, examiners are reading your thesis, they can be quite critical uh, if they feel you're being over-selective and only choosing things which substantiate your uh, position. Next one has quite a uh, clunky name, the Giant's Shoulder Rider. In other words, quoting giants in your uh, engagement with the literature, Bourdieu, Foucault, etc., etc. We all know those names. Um, and hoping in some way that there'd be a halo effect simply by showing that you're familiar with their work, whether or not it's that relevant. Next one is bella figura, uh, Italian phrase fare bella figura, making yourself look good, trying to be uh, the, the saint, the good person, taking the moral high ground and so on, uh, in what can be quite an uncritical way. The hobby horse jockey, somebody who only rides their own particular theoretical perspective and doesn't, uh, for example, and doesn't take a critical perspective on it. And finally, the magpie, the, the uh, orientation that uh, can't really discriminate, chooses, uh, chooses anything that's lying around, especially if it's uh, shiny and attractive, um, again, regardless of the work that it can do uh, for the research. So uh, that's kind of the substance of the argument of the book, um, and uh, the rest of the of this uh, book on Amazon, which is downloadable either by Kindle or as a paperback, um, uh, does three things um, in order to help you to engage with these ideas. First thing it does is. Uh, it gives examples from actual doctoral theses of the five key orientations that I listed above the presenter, the critic, the taxonomist, the toolmaker, the lo lagunae locator. Um, then uh, it gives an example um, of an abstract from a doctoral thesis and shows how one might try to answer the following questions from that that abstract. Uh, so the questions are, what areas of the literature need to be engaged with in this thesis, as far as one can tell from uh, the abstract? Um, and remember that uh, earlier on in this video I said that one needs to think about um, the research questions firstly, uh, secondly the methods and methodology uh, used, Thirdly, the conceptual and theoretic, theoretical resources deployed. And fourthly, the knowledge claims. Now, all of those things should appear in brief, in summary, in the abstract. So uh, it's possible to um, look at those and think, OK, well, what areas of literature uh, would follow from this abstract and those things? The second question what orientation or orientations should the author adopt in engaging with these areas of literature, given the nature of the, of the study as set out in the abstract? And thirdly, what would the introductory paragraph of the chapter engaging with the literature look like? Um, so that's a try to try to help you to practice uh, writing such a paragraph. Um, and then... Uh, some other abstracts are uh, offered for you to um, try to answer those questions and to practice uh, thinking about that. 
And then the book points to, finally points to a range of resources available uh, on the web, resources of different sorts, that uh, can help you in finding literature, relevant literature, evaluating it, and manipulating it. Um, and uh, I hope you find those resources valuable. So uh, that's it then, and uh, I really hope you found the video valuable, and if you want to, please do download uh, the, um, the, the, um, the Kindle book or the paperback. Thanks a lot.